everybody, and welcome to Des Moines University's mini medical school, week number three. This is the second part in our little mini series focused on mental health in this year's mini med school. The lecture tonight is entitled Lifestyle Habits to Combat Depression, and it is presented by Dr. Adam Batroche. If you're just joining us for the first time, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Hannah DeGeest. I am the Community and Public Affairs Manager here at DMU. So tonight, as you watch this lecture, please remember any questions that you might have and send them to us at questions at dmu.edu. We'll be sure to answer those and get right back to you. Okay, let's get started. Dr. Adam Petroche is a psychiatrist working in DMU's new behavioral health clinic. He was born and raised in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and received his Bachelor's of Science degree in biology from Luther College. He went on to receive his Doctor of Osteopathic Medicine degree from Des Moines University, graduating in 2017. Following medical school, Dr. Pertosh completed his residency in psychiatry at the University of Kansas in Kansas City. During residency, Dr. Pertosh served as a chief resident at the Kansas City Veterans Hospital and received awards in excellence and scholarship. He has published research in the use of psychedelics in psychiatry and has an interest in lifestyle changes for the management of depression and anxiety. Welcome, Dr. Bertrosh. Hello, thank you all for being here. My name is Adam Bertrosh. I'm a uh, faculty psychiatrist here at Des Moines University. Um, a little bit about myself before we get started. I'm an Iowa native. Um, I graduated from Des Moines University from medical school in 2017 and just recently completed my residency training in psychiatry um, from the University of Kansas in Kansas City. And so I was recently hired out of residency to help start the behavioral health clinic here. So thank you for being here. Um, in my training, I spent, you know, a, a couple of months actually researching lifestyle changes for the treatment and prevention of depression. And so I kind of just wanted to share a little bit about what I discovered during those research months with you today. And so we'll kind of start with what is depression and what are some of the manifestations of depression? And so kind of the hallmark symptoms of depression are just feelings of sadness, depressed mood, or just overall loss of interest or pleasure in things you normally enjoy. And so little interest in other activities. Um, it has a lot of associated symptoms. And so beyond the core symptoms, you can get a sleep disturbance that can be insomnia or sleeping way too much. Um, appetite changes, again, you can either have an increased appetite or very little appetite. Um, a lot of depressed individuals are have low energy and fatigue during the day. Um, and also hopelessness at times can be a feature. And so that's just kind of lack of any sort of optimism or feeling that your condition will never improve, you'll never get out of the depression and you don't have a future. Um, worthlessness, it, Feelings of worthlessness or guilt are pretty common, um, like you have nothing really to offer, feeling useless or insignificant. Um, depression can definitely affect concentration, make things a little bit more difficult to task, a little bit more difficult during the day to complete. Um, and then also restlessness or slowed movements or speech thought process can be either sped up or slowed down. And then also thoughts of death or suicide can happen in depression as well. So those are kind of the core features and associated features that we see. Um, how common is depression in the United States? So in the United States, um, in the past year, about 17.3 million Americans had a major depressive episode, which we call it. Um, on an annual basis, that's about 7% of American adults suffer from depression every year. Um, and in their lifetime, about 26% of people will have a depressive episode. And so that's a huge chunk of the US population. And then the impairment level can vary significantly between two people. And so about 63% of people will have severe impairment, meaning you know, they're not able to complete function at work or function in their relationships. And it's just extremely impairing and difficult for them to manage in a variety of aspects of their life. And then, you know, it's very common, but a lot of people still don't seek treatment for a variety of reasons. And so about 35% of people will not seek treatment for their depression. 
And so that kind of leads us to the question, what causes depression? And so there's a bunch of different causes um, and it's multifactorial. And so we'll start with kind of changes in your brain. So um, there's a variety of different chemicals that have been researched that can influence depression. And so we call those chemicals, you know, that how your neurons in your brain, the cells in your brain communicate, those are neurotransmitters. And so these include like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, and there's a variety of others that have been studied in depression as well and have been associated with depression. Also, there's specific regions in your brain that have been associated with depression, but we won't go into too much detail there. Genetics can play a role. So depression has a tendency to run in families. So those with a first degree relative with depression are at risk of developing it themselves. Personality can play a role. So there's variations in personality that can make people susceptible to depression or maybe make them less susceptible or less likely to experience depression. And so personality plays a role in how people respond to stress, how they respond emotionally to their environment or their surroundings. And kind of an example of a trait that may place people at risk is neuroticism. So that's one of the personality traits. Also, environmental factors can be huge. And so there's a, just a huge list of environmental factors that may cause somebody to go into a major depressive episode or a depressive episode. And so that can be range from grief, financial strain, um, divorce or separation, chronic medical illness. And there's just a variety of factors that can be at play here. And then currently, um, you know, winter and fall months can actually play a role. So in seasonal depression, um, and so a lot of these things are not independent of each other and many things can impact um, somebody, somebody's a, somebody going into a major depressive episode. So how is depression typically treated? And, you know, this presentation is about lifestyle changes, but, you know, the standard of treatment is antidepressant medications and psychotherapy. And so this lecture is not really intended to be a replacement for the standard of care. All these things, you know, if somebody's suffering from depression, they should be encouraged to, you know, have that discussion with their physician to see what the best treatment for them would be. And so in general, that's going to be antidepressant medications and psychotherapy. Some of these lifestyle changes can help, but they're probably not as researched as the standard of care at this point. But so antidepressant medications, you know, over the years, there have been more and more new and novel medications or even treatments that have come out for depression. And over the years, you know, they've been, a lot of them have been equally effective with less side effects. And so these medications generally target the chemicals in your brain we talked about on the previous uh, couple slides ago. And so those would be serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. In, in, in regards to the therapy, there's a lot of different therapy modalities that therapists will employ to treat depression. And it's kind of about, and it may be provider dependent on which one they d decide to use in certain circumstances. And so therapy can be extraordinarily beneficial. Um, as effective as medications and in some circumstances better than medications. So both of these are very good options for depression. There are other options as well um, beyond just medications and therapy, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. So we'll go ahead and get kind of transition to the lifestyle changes that we're going to be talking about. There's been a lot of lifestyle changes for depression that have been researched over the years. So this is not a comprehensive list by any means. Today, we're primarily going to be focusing on exercise, sleep and diet as potential targets for um, lifestyle changes that can treat depression. Other ones that have been researched are like meditation, relaxation, mindfulness techniques, you know, substance use cessation. So stopping alcohol, any drug use can have a huge impact on uh, depression. And then also, you know, recreation, including like socialization with other people can actually influence improved depression as well. But so far today, we're gonna talk about exercise, sleep and diet. 
So we'll go ahead and start with exercise and depression and how it can impact depression. So exercise has been, you know, the focus of exercise and medicine has been a lot about, you know, its benefits in cardiovascular disease, diabetes, certain cancers, osteoporosis. Um, but there's actually a good degree of research on exercise and how it can be beneficial in both the prevention and treatment of depression. And so there's a couple theories as to why and how this works. And so depressed individuals have a reduced amount of what's called brain derived neurotrophic factor or BDNF. And so BDNF is essentially your implicated in your brain's ability to adapt and it's called neuroplasticity. So depressed individuals have lower BDNF. They also have increased inflammatory markers and depression has been associated with that. Um, they also have increased oxidative stress, which comes from chemicals that can lead to actually like cell damage or cell death in your body. Um, they also have been found to have increased cortisol, which is released in response to distress and is also associated with depression. And so in general, exercise kind of does the opposite of what these chemicals do in depressed individuals. So exercise leads to increased BDNF, decreased inflammation, oxidative stress, and cortisol. So that's kind of how it's theorized as to why exercise is beneficial in depression. So how beneficial is exercise for depression? So when you're looking at how exercise influences depression, it can be divided into preventing future depressive episodes and also the treatment of the depressive episode itself, people that are already depressed. And so studies have looked into both the prevention and the treatment. And so there are studies that have looked in the level, at the level of acuity of people at baseline, controlled for their baseline level of depression, and followed them to see what the likelihood of developing a depressive episode in the future would be. So they kind of looked at their baseline physical activity and just followed them to see who is developing depression down the road. And so it has been found that sedentary lifestyles, people that are not very active, it places people at risk of depression in the future, even after controlling for the baseline level of depression between the two groups. So the more sedentary somebody is, the higher risk for depression they may, may be down the road. And so other studies have taken it a little bit further to see how much physical activity can reduce the risk of developing depression in the future. And so these studies have had a huge range of benefit. The ranges in these studies have been very wide. They suggest that physical activity can reduce the chance of future depression between eight and as high as 63%. So that's a huge range, um, but it is promising. So now transitioning to those patients that are currently suffering from a depressive episode. And so it's for the treatment of depression. There has been research comparing the benefit of exercise to the standard of care, as we discussed before. And so these studies are kind of mixed, um, but several well-constructed studies have shown that exercise may be almost as good or as good as the standard of care in reducing depression. So that would be comparing exercise to medications or therapy, and they've been almost as good or as good. Um, but there, you know, there's some indication that medications may work faster or therapy might be better in the long term, but it's something that needs to be teased out. So the remission rate for individuals in a current depressive episode that engage in exercise as part of the treatment have shown widely variable response rates again. So some of the trials show a remission rate after implementing an exercise program to be around 20%, but some have been demonstrated a remission rate in those individuals as high as 74%. And so remission rate when exercising, when exercise used as treatment is widely variable. So the next question would be how much exercise is actually required for the antidepressant effects? So we have a kind of a good idea of the potential benefit in prevention and treatment, but how much do you actually have to do to get that benefit? And so a lot of the studies vary significantly in the type of exercise, um, the frequency in which they're meeting for these programs, the duration of those meetings, those sessions that they're having, um, and then also the duration of the actual regimen, whether it's 10 days, 10 weeks, six months. 
And so it's really hard to standardize and make recommendations just because of the wide variability. But in the studies, they often go off of already guidelines that have been in place for the general public, just the general recommended amount of exercise for somebody in a week or um, the recommendations based off other medical conditions such as cardiovascular disease. And so these are some of those recommendations. So I listed them all here. Um, some recommend 30 minutes three to five times a week, um, 150 minutes total in a week divided into three to five sessions of moderate intensity exercise, more vigorous exercise, 75 minutes a week divided into three to five sessions. But it's important to note that there's been studies in depression that, you know, the individuals don't meet those requirements. They don't meet the length and duration and the number of sessions a week. And so some of them have been a lot shorter duration um, of each session or less frequent, and they've actually still found mood benefit. Um, and so total, most of the studies, like I said, have been you know longer than 10 weeks, but there's actually been shorter term studies, like 10 days, and they've showed mood, mood benefits. And so I guess the moral of the story would be that um, patients suffering depression from depression still may get benefit if they can't meet these rigorous standards of these guidelines. And so something is better than nothing. Now, the next question would be, what type of exercise is beneficial? And again, there's been a huge variation in the type of exercise in the studies. And so initially it was believed that aerobic exercise was gonna be the only thing that's beneficial. And so that's a sustained period of increased heart rate and breathing, um, such as jogging. Um, as opposed to anaerobic exercise, which would be more short bursts of activity for a shorter duration, such as weightlifting. And turns out that's partially true. So there might be a dose dependent relationship in intensity of the exercise in regards to the benefit for depression. So going from low to moderate intensity might be more beneficial. Um, moderate to vigorous intensity might be even more beneficial, but it appears to plateau at some point. So you know, you may get increasing benefit up to a certain point, and then there might be not be an additional benefit after that. But it's important to note that low intensity exercise is also demonstrated to be effective. And so anything's better than nothing. They've looked at cycling, yoga, walking, and resistance training. Um, and those have also been beneficial, not just jogging or the uh, more aerobic exercises. So I guess the recommendation would be any activity is better than none. Um, additionally, you know, going from moderate to vigorous intensity may cause increased dropout and reduce compliance for a lot of people. Um, you know, vigorous exercises, you know, it's just not as enjoyable for a lot of people. So that's another thing to consider. Other options would be group programs. You know, you get a sense of connectedness, structured exercise regimens may promote compliance. And it would be the strongest recommendation is to tailor these to the individual. You know, especially people that are living moderately sedentary lives and haven't exercised for a long period of time, it'd be important for those individuals to work with their physician or provider about um, tailoring that exercise program and maybe gradually building on that. Um, but those would be kind of the recommendations. And so kind of in summary for exercise and depression, Exercise may, be, may help in reducing depressive symptoms or help prevent future depressive episodes. Individuals should discuss with their physician to help implement an appropriate exercise regimen to their fitness level to promote compliance and follow through. More exercise may be more beneficial in treating depression up to a certain point, but low levels of physical activity may still be beneficial for depression. Many different types of exercise have been shown to be beneficial, including running, jogging, cycling, resistance training, walking, and yoga. And choosing a regimen that you enjoy may prevent dropout and promote compliance. And group exercise programs may be beneficial due to social connectiveness that they bring. And now we're gonna look at diet and depression. And it's important to note that compared to exercise, most of the studies on diet have been a little bit weaker and there's not a robust um, literature on diet and how it impacts depression. Um, also, most of the studies are looking at um, your diet and how it impacts future depressive episodes. So it's more preventative rather than as a treatment. 
whereas exercise, they kind of looked at both as a preventative measure and also treatment. And so this slide may look very familiar to you because this is how it's theorized that diet can impact depression. And so again, we're looking at increases in BDNF, reduced inflammation, reduced oxidative stress, and reduced cortisol, depending on what your diet is. So what dietary patterns are associated with depression? So that's the next question. Um, it's again, really difficult to assess diet because there's so many different food groups and dietary patterns is really difficult to standardize. But I listed kind of some diets that have been listed in some of the studies. So that the first would be Western diet. And so that diet is consistent of a high amount of processed food, refined grains, low amounts of fruits and vegetables, red meat, high fat dairy, desserts, fast food, stuff like that. Unhealthy diets, a lot of overlap. So sweets, red meat, hot dogs, sausages, biscuits, um, cake, chocolate. That's kind of the unhealthy diet pattern. The snack pattern would be like, again, like chocolate, candy, carbonated drinks and preserved foods. And then animal product pattern, which would be just mostly red meats. And so I listed those foods down here that have been associated. And so there's been studies that have demonstrated that there's actually no association with some of these patterns with depression um, down the road, but some studies have made an association of up to 80% increased risk of depression with these dietary patterns. Um, there's also kind of a concern for bias. So, you know, you know, there, you know, it's people with depression may be more likely to eat kind of these dietary patterns. So it's kind of a chicken or the egg argument. And again, we just need more research to really figure out, um, are these patterns actually associated with an increased likelihood of depression, that 80% increased likelihood that I mentioned before. <clears throat> now we'll transition to diets that might be preventative for future depressive episodes. And so again, you know, you need a larger amount of research, more standardization, higher quality studies to say for sure. Um, but a lot of the the preventative diets that have come up are the traditional diet, the Japanese dietary pattern, and then the Mediterranean diet. Um, and so there's a ton of overlap, but in general, you know, the, the studies have been on whole grains, high amounts of fruits and vegetables, seafood such as fish, beans and legumes, um, consuming olive oil and low fat dairy. And so how effective is this dietary pattern in preventing depression? And again, there's been a wide variation um, of the effectiveness in preventing future depressive episodes, but some studies have shown that up to 40% reduced likelihood of depression when consuming these diets compared to the diets we saw on the other slide. And so kind of in conclusion in, in the dietary patterns, so um, those that may reduce the likelihood of depressive episodes were, would be dietary patterns consisting of a lot of vegetables, fish, fruits, whole grains, legumes and beans, and then low fat dairy. Whereas on the other hand, um, dietary patterns that may predispose somebody for depression would be red meats, processed food, refined grains, desserts, sweets, and high fat dairy. All right. And so kind of the last segment of this presentation is insomnia and how that influences depression. And so insomnia is also a very highly prevalent in the United States. Um, it's estimated that about 30% and as high as actually 50% of the general population have report some sort of sleep disturbance. Um, of those about 10% meet the actual diagnostic criteria for insomnia. And there's a huge overlap between insomnia and psychiatric illness. Um, you know, about 40% of patients with a psychiatric illness will have some sort of insomnia. Um, and in depression, it's very, very high. So up to 90% of patients suffering from depression will report some sort of sleep difficulty. And so we kind of go back to why would treating um, insomnia improve depression? And we go back to this kind of the same um, mechanisms that we discussed before. So 
Um, insomnia is associated with increased inflammatory markers, same with depression, disruption in neurotransmission, um, the oxidative stress and free radical creation, and then increased cortisol secretion, you know, that stress hormone. And so treating insomnia may improve all of these and reduce depression. So what is the association between insomnia and depression? Um, persistent sleep disturbance has been found to be a risk factor for developing depression. So they essentially looked at people at baseline, controlled for um, their level of depression, and then divide them in two groups, those with insomnia and those without. And so those with insomnia and no baseline level depression were at two to five times the risk of developing a depressive episode in the future, regardless of their history of depression. And so it's been shown to be a risk factor for developing depression down the road. And so, and they've also done research on the treatment of insomnia in people that are already depressed and have found that if you treat the insomnia within the depressive episode, it can have a moderate to large effect in reducing depression independent of the depressive episode. And so insomnia can have a robust impact on developing depression and also your ability to recover from depression. And so how do you treat insomnia in general? And um, patients with insomnia, you know, there's non-pharmacologic treatments, non-medication treatments for insomnia, which is generally the first line. And so that involves both behavioral techniques and also psychologic techniques um, to improve sleep. And then there's also pharmacologic treatments oftentimes used in kind of um, for a short duration to improve insomnia as well. So that's kind of the standard of care. You know, if you go, go with these techniques, it can have not just an impact on insomnia, but also in preventing and also treating depression. So kind of in conclusion, you know, exercise, you know, extremely beneficial for a wide range of conditions, but it also can be beneficial in both the prevention and treatment of depression and depressive episodes. You know, you need more research to confirm the exact frequency, the type, the intensity, and how long you need to do it. But in general, it's safe to say that exercise can have a, a pretty big impact on depression. Certain dietary patterns may increase the risk of depression while others reduce the risk of having a depressive episode. Um, a, quite a bit more research um, and higher quality studies are definitely required to further support this. But in general, the Mediterranean diet at this time would be recommended in potentially preventing um, future depressive episodes. Sleep disturbance and insomnia um, can place people at risk of depressive episodes in the future. So treating insomnia during a depressive episode may reduce the severity and also the duration of a depressive episode. And so those are kind of my concluding remarks, you know, make sure you're exercising, um, eating healthy, and then taking care of yourself and making sure you're sleeping at night. And those can have a huge impact on depression. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. Thank you for uh, tuning in. And these are kind of my references for this presentation if anybody's interested. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Petrosh. Wow, that was pretty interesting. I hope you all enjoyed that as much as I did. I know I definitely picked up some new things I will be trying out in my life. Okay, well, any questions that you have, please send them to questions at dmu.edu and I will see you next week. Bye-bye.